Just what are the seven heads and ten horns of the great red dragon in Revelation 12? This is part 81 of the Revelation study. We've been working through Revelation. Revelation 12 is about the woman in the wilderness, and she's pursued by that great red dragon. So we're looking through that. We're working through it. Today we're going to look at the great red dragon with the seven heads and the ten horns. We, the only way to understand this, of course, is by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Jesus' words are spiritual. We compare spirit with spirit, a little bit here, a little bit there. We know that it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, Proverbs 25, 2, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. And we're a royal priesthood. We, wanna, we love to search out the, this thing in the Bible, and we're going to do that by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Okay, here's the passage. There appeared another wonder in heaven. And that word wonder, of course, is the Greek word semion, which literally means a sign, which is a symbol. It's like a signpost. It represents something else. It's a wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads, ten horns, and there are seven crowns upon his heads. We want to look and understand exactly what that means. Okay, so the key questions are, who exactly is the dragon? Why is this dragon considered great? Why is he red? And what are the seven heads and ten horns? And why do those seven heads have crowns? We're going to look at that in this study. Please consider subscribing to this channel, The Rock of Offense. There's a little red button in the bottom right-hand corner. And let's move on in this study. Okay, so first, who is the dragon? And that's very easy to understand. Because the Bible in Revelation is very clear so we understand who this dragon is. Revelation 12, 9, that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. So we know that this dragon is none other than the devil, Satan, the serpent. They're all the same name for the same person. But the names mean something different, and it gives us a different aspect about that entity, Satan. Again, in Revelation 20, 12, he laid hold of that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Again, there's two places in Revelation, and every word's established in two witnesses. So it's very clear that the dragon is none other than Satan. And by the way, that word dragon in the Greek, it's drakon, which literally means it's a large, monstrous serpent. In the Greek, it only occurs in Revelation, but it does occur in the Old Testament as well. And when we look at the Old Testament, there's some interesting occurrences of this dragon. And we see, for example, in Jeremiah 51, talking about Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has made me an empty vessel. He had swallowed me up like a dragon. And this is talking about the Babylonian captivity of Judah. Judah was God's people in the Old Testament. We, he, he was swallowed. The king of Babylon was like a dragon because he swallowed them up. He ate them up. And we recall that Satan, the devil, is a devourer and lion seeking whom he may devour. And, and so that's what the dragon, again, represents the king of Babylon, which is a type of Satan. And we recall from Isaiah 14 that the king of Babylon is none other than Satan. It's a symbol for Satan. We also see the pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was called a great dragon that lies in the midst of his rivers. Again, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt was the great persecutor of Israel in the Old Testament. So we see strong correlation, and we see this thread run all through the Bible. But let's go forward and understand this dragon a little bit more. Why is this dragon, the, again, the dragon is a devouring, large, monstrous beast. Why is he considered gr great? Why in the world is he great? And when we look back at Isaiah 14, which is talking about the king of Babylon, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut to the ground? Who did weaken the nations? You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. He thought he was great. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. This is that entity that was the main adversary. And that's what Satan means, is the adversary. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He wanted to rule the, the world. He wanted to rule all God's people. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He wanted to be great, just like God is great, but only God is the great one. And, but the dragon, this devouring monster, wanted to be great as well. Okay, just a little bit more on the greatness of this great red dragon. 
Satan was the original anointed cherub. Take up a lamentation, but then King of Tyrus. The King of Tyrus here forms a portrait, a picture of Satan. You sealed up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You've been in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone where you're covering. You are the anointed cherub that covers. Satan was just a beautiful anointed cherub, perfect in wisdom and beauty. I have set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. And that's the fall of Satan in the Garden of Eden. But he was originally this wonderful, beautiful, great covering cherub. So we see that this, and this beautiful cherub has become this great red dragon. Okay, moving on. Why is that dragon red? And when we look at this red in the New Testament Greek, it's the word peros. And it literally means to be red like fire. The word fire in the Greek is pur, P-U-R. And so the, the Greek word red is taken from the word fire. It's a fiery red. And that recalls to our mind, Matthew 25, you shall say them to the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire, the pur, prepared for the devil and his angels. Fire is intimately linked with this great red dragon. And also, Revelation 6, 4, we've looked at this in a previous video. There went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat there to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there's given unto a great sword. And this was a symbol for Satan. And we looked at that in our previous video, which I'll put on tag on this slide. Red is also the color of blood. We see that in 2 Kings 3 and Psalm 75. And that we also recall... In Isaiah 1.18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The color red is the color related to sin, because it's the color of blood. And it's the color of Satan, the red dragon. The, the blood and the sin is tied to the great red dragon. Okay, so now... The main topic we want to talk about are these seven heads and ten horns. Okay, and the combination of seven heads and ten horns occurs in four passages in the Bible. First, we're looking at Revelation 12, the dragon which has seven heads and ten horns. And unequivocally, it's Satan. It's Satan. We see that in Revelation 12. But it also shows up uh, in Revelation 17. The scarlet colored beast, again with seven heads and ten horns. And we've done a video on that, but and it's Satan is that beast. And when we look at the context and there the seventh head is the Antichrist, but it, Revelation twelve and Revelation seventeen, in both those cases, those seven heads and ten horns are on a on a beast that's either the dragon or the scarlet colored beast of Revelation, it points to Satan and Satan's kingdom, as we're gonna see shortly. But when we look at other occurrences of that, for example, Revelation 13, it's a big uh, leopard beast, and it has seven heads and ten horns. But we know that this leopard beast is the Antichrist because the dragon gives his authority to this leopard beast, which is the Antichrist. So we see that this Antichrist takes control of Satan's kingdom that has the seven heads and the ten horns. And the fourth occurrence, the final one, is in Daniel 7. And there's actually four different beasts. And the fourth beast, which has the ten horns, represents the Roman Empire. But, but the third beast, which is the, the, was the kingdom of Greece, which has the four heads. And when you count the four beasts and all the heads, there's seven heads and ten horns. But the ten horns belongs to the final beast, which is the Roman Empire, which is still in existence to this day. That, that form of govern, government and that form of ruling and that form of philosophy, the Greco-Roman Empire is still with us today. And those ten horns, the, there's a little horn that springs up from those ten horns, and that's the Antichrist. So in all these cases, there's little nuances and differences in the discussions on the seven heads and ten horns. So we want to go on now and understand what heads, horns, the number seven and then the number ten mean, and that's going to give us a very clear picture of what the seven heads and the ten horns are. 
So first, let's look at the symbolic number, meaning of the number seven. It's used extensively in the book of Revelation. We've done a video on this. I'll tag it on the slide. But number seven, and please consider we're looking at that video, because it's the perfection of purpose. It's not just the perfection, which a lot of people believe. It's, it really ties into the perfection of purpose. And that video goes into why that is. So the number seven is the perfection of purpose. The number 10, when we look through the Bible, is the complete fullness. It, it, it points to fullness. For example, Deuteronomy 4.13, that there's 10 commandments. He declared unto you this covenant which he commanded to perform even 10 commandments. The 10 commandments are a beautiful summary of, of the moral law of God. And he wrote them on two tables of stone. There's many other occurrences of 10 in the Bible. Luke 19.13, it's a parable about um, the master calls his 10 servants and delivers to them 10 pounds. And he says, occupy till, they, till he comes back. That's a symbol of God's people and the, the faithfulness that, that needs to be present in God's people. But again, the 10 re represents the fullness. Revelation 17.12, the 10 horns we're going to see in a moment are 10 kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings as one hour of the beast at the day of the battle of Armageddon at the final day of judgment. And that 10 represents all. It represents the complete fullness of the, the kingdoms that are going to battle against the lamb. Okay, moving on, what's the symbol of the head? What does the head symbolize? And we see very clear evidence. And first, we've looked at the woman's head with the crown of 12 stars. So we've talked about that on our previous video, but the head is a place of authority. The head is where the lead, it's where the, the, the brain, the mind, it's the leadership. And we see that Christ is the head of the body of Christ, the church. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So the head represents that which is an authority, that which is preeminent. Deuteronomy 28, the stranger, he shall lend to you and you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head and you shall be the tail. It, it has to do with who's in control, who's taking the lead. So we see, and there's many places in the Bible that talk about this. I challenge you to, to, to look at a concordance and find the occurrence of head throughout the Bible. There's many, many symbolic references to this all through the Bible. Okay, so finally we look at the heads also are kings. Again, the leadership of a country, for example. Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. You, O king, are king of kings, for the God of heaven have given you a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory, given into your hand. And he has, he has made you ruler over them. You are this head of gold. He was the head. He was the king of kings. And again, there's a lot of symbolic meaning in Daniel, too, about this great statue. But again, the head points to the leadership. The scarlet beast, Revelation 17, the beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottom of this pit and go into perdition. The seven heads are seven mountains on the, which the woman sits and they are seven kings. Again, uh, the heads represent kings. Okay, the crowns that are on these seven heads represent royalty. A crown is a symbol of royalty. For example, King Joash of Israel he brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony and they made him king and anointed him. They clapped their hands and said, God saved the king. A, a, a king has a crown. Ahasuerus in the book of Esther to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the, with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty for she was fair to look upon. It's the royal crown. Jesus Christ, of course, Matthew 27, 29, when they had platted a crown of thorns, they were mocking him, they were scorning him, they put upon his head and a reed in his right hand, they bowed to his knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. But again, the crown represents king. So we see very clear evidence that the crown points to the king nature, that these seven heads of this red dragon are kings, they're leaders. Okay, and finally, let's look at horns. Horns in the Bible represent strength. It's the strength. For example, Daniel 8. This is when Greece defeats the media, media poor Persian kingdom. I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with collar against him, and smote the ram, and broke his two horns. And there was no power in the ram. 
because his horns were broken. That's where the strength is. He lost his power to stand before him, but he cast him to the ground and stomped on him. There was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. He lost his strength. He lost his power. Zechariah 1, then lifted up mine eyes and saw, and I behold, four horns. These are the four horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Four horns represented the strength of Satan's kingdom as it scattered, scattered God's people. And of course, Jesus Christ is our horn of salvation. He's our strength of salvation. So we see that horns all through the Bible represent strength. Okay, just going a little further with the ten horns. The ten horns represent end time world kingdoms that are, that are present, that are battling with Jesus Christ when he comes back a second time. And again, the scarlet beast of Revelation 17, which is a picture again of Satan and his kingdom. The ten horns, which you saw are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. And that's the beast, the Revelation 13 beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and their strength. There it is again, the horns represent power and strength. And that's why they're horns, because they're strong, and they're also kingdoms, strong kingdoms. And they give it to the beast to support the beast, and they make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. And that's at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And again, ten represents fullness. It's, it shouldn't be taken as literally ten nations, and try, people, many people have tried to do that. this. But it's not a litter of bold ten. It's symbolized of the fullness at the end time of the kingdoms of this world standing against Jesus Christ. It's similar to those ten toes of that great statue in Daniel 2. And I encourage you to read Daniel 2. It's a symbol of those ten horns at the end time that battle against Christ, but they're defeated. Okay, so let's bring this together a little bit. The seven heads and ten horns represents Satan's kingdom. The great red dragon is Satan, and the horns and the heads represent his kingdom. The seven is the perfection of his satanic purpose. The heads represent Satan's authority in this world, because he's the god of this world. The crowns represent that he controls the kingdoms of this world. The kingdoms of this world are in subjection to him. He was, he was able to offer these kingdoms to Christ when he tempted him in the wilderness. The ten represents the fullness. The horns represents the strength of Satan's kingdom in the world. And these horns don't have that, those crowns yet until that last battle against Christ where the crowns will represent the, the kingdoms, the ten kingdoms, the final kingdoms of this world going to battle against Christ in the battle of Armageddon. Satan's kingdom, the prince of the power of the air. He's the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. He's the God of this world that blinds the minds of those who believe not. And here's that passage that the devil takes Jesus Christ up into exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of this world. The ten, the fullness, the seven, the perfection of the purpose. He said, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. So the question is, are we going to follow the kingdoms of this world? Are we following Satan's kingdom? Are we following the kingdom of God, which is not of this world? Okay, so just a quick summary of this great red dragon. There's a lot of beautiful imagery in here. It's all tied to the wickedness of Satan, though. The great, the chief, the prideful, the great adversary, the, the anointed cherub that covers. The, 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 he's the great adversary. The red points to sin and that he'll be judged in the fire. The seven heads, the perfection of purpose of, the, of Satan's wicked kingdom. The ten horns, the complete fullness of strength of Satan's kingdom at the end time that will battle against Jesus Christ. We see it all here. We're going to look at this again when we get to Revelation 13 and again when we get to Revelation 17. But just to set the, the stage, God provides us this beautiful information right here in Revelation 12. Now we're going to look next time, part 82, the dragon's tail. What's that tail mean? What's the symbolism of the tail? And it casts down one-third of the stars to the earth. We're going to look at that. Please consider subscribing to this channel. And thank you very much for watching this video.